Welcome back to Factory Sealed. It is June 26, 2016. My name's Eric Peters, and joining me today, Mr. Daniel Curtis. Hello. And you cut out halfway through your hello, so we're off to just a spiffing start. Are you kidding? How's that new internet, Dan? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and Jim- Crank it harder! Crank it! <laughs> Crystal, get on it! We need more cranking! <laughs> and back again, Jess Clarkson. What up? Welcome back, Jess. Thank you. We, Hi, Jess. we really missed you on the last half of our most monumental episode where we provided all of our personal <laughs> feedback. Thoughts. I think it's only fitting that Jess dropped out for that somehow. Well, yeah. had it been Aaron, then that would have been appropriate. I got kicked out of the hotel room. Literally kicked out. That is pretty sweet. After I paid $25 to stay there later. Like, I tried to bribe them. It didn't work. Imagine just some big burly woman coming in the hotel room and just picking you up. And just throwing you up. Out. <laughs> Olga comes in. Time to go. Picks you up, chair, desk, and everything. Literally just got, literally just got hair everywhere on her face. That's what happened. <laughs> So are we sure and like a big mole with a hair coming out of it. A single hair. A single hair. Or three. Like a light cord that you could pull. Oh, That would hurt so much. What would it do when you pull it? Bleed, probably. Yeah, she lights up. <laughs> it's nice to have you back, Jess. Oh, I thank you. We missed you on the last show. Yes. Um, selling your house sucks. <sighs> well, not when you're selling them for that price. Hopefully. Hopefully. Ugh. Ugh. Too much. Yeah, the prices are a little bit different up here than they are in America. Yeah. I would you are not building a case for anybody to want to move to Toronto. Yeah. Like, yeah. We're just outside of the city and our house will probably go for seven fifty ish. Oh, and it's so um, small. Yeah, it's nine hundred square foot bungalow. Nine hundred square feet. If we were, yeah, if we were downtown, we it would be like a million plus. So, for what? our younger listeners who don't understand the ins and outs of a house, nine hundred square feet is barely larger than a bathroom. <laughs> Your typical American lavatory. Is about a thousand square feet. That's because they need to get their fat asses through the door frame. Ninety <laughs> percent of that is the entryway to the bathroom. Yeah, that's a super small house. Uh, my house is twice that size. Isn't your house like made of dollar bills though? And like a oh, hundred thousand yeah. dollars, probably. It sold. Your, I, I imagine your house is like you know on the Sims when you put in the money chain, you can just do whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. Like every, every week, Eric adds a new wing to his opulent mansion. Well, it's every, called the American cheat. I'd, I'd opt to take my paychecks in like sheets of money directly from the treasury, and then I just slap some glue on the back and just roll it onto the wall for wallpaper. Basically, literal hundred dollar bills I'm lining the wall. I'm thinking that Tom may have to hang his cap up as the poshest person in the room when you're around sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I can really take it to the next level. I think you're nearly a top hat and monocle level. I'm getting there. I mean, Possibly pocket watch. Fingers crossed. It's it, it, it's it's happening. Tom has inspired me. He came over. He talked. Ta- imagine you in that outfit, Which, going down a road in Arizona in a desert punting boat, just on the like <laughs> the front of the ship, pinky in the air, <laughs> just looking just down gonna, my just, nose just at you. Passing by, doing a wave like the. Queen at all the prowls on the pavement. Mm, punt a little harder, sir. Hmm, quite. Mm, that one looked at me wrong. Daniel, crank that generator quick. Yes, master! <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, just my house is twice that size, and last summer sold for 
148. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. I'm and trying to find a place. How big is your lot? Not that we want to get into real estate talk, but like the lot itself. Our, we have a huge, uh, not huge property. It's, I don't know. Give it to me in feet. Oh, it was in the listing. I think it's like 60 by 124 or something. What is that in square feet? That was feet. Yeah, I know. So do some math. Oh, my God. You could do what that. What is 60, 60 by 124? Is that the same as maths? No. Maths yeah. is dumb. Except dumber. <laughs> oh, by the way, before we get into everything, we should mention that Tom is not here. Oh, yeah. Tom's not here, guys. 7440. So same size as my lot. My house is way bigger. You could move down here and buy five houses when you sell yours. Basically. And you could, and that's the thing. It'd be like it's Fable 3. You could just become a slumlord. Yeah. Yeah. And rent down here is sweet. You could find people in no time. I See, this is, this is my plan. I've already got Tom working on it. And now that Brexit passed, I mean, Dan, come on. You yeah, have a reason that- to leave. Yeah, this country's going to shit. Except Trump. <laughs> no way. No. No. I think he's a swell guy. So a, swell. Yeah, great guy. Love his golf courses. The best. I love his luxurious hair. Ooh. I wonder what it feels like. It looks like a hair stuck. Do you, th- <laughs> Do you think it's crunchy? I feel like, yeah, it would be probably very, like, straw-like. Synthetic fibers, probably. <laughs> I think you guys should move to Phoenix. Yeah, apparently I could just come over and buy most of the town, so all good. Yeah. Well, I mean, not with your devalued British pound anymore. You'd have to get some real American dollars. I'll just steal some of your wallpaper and just go nuts. <laughs> well, I'd make you stay out back in the shed. I can't have you oh, mucking up my house. I imagine your shed is the size of my flat, though, so I'm not really bothered. It's only about 1,600 square foot shed. I don't know what that is, but okay. I don't know how to convert it into non-real measurements. That's fine. I'll yeah. just be confused. So, how is everybody? Dan is reeling from Brexit. Yeah, that's a shit show and a half, really. Has the country completely imploded yet? It's getting there. Yeah? Most, apparently, most MPs are quitting today. That's crazy. MPs. Yeah. Ministers Members of, of Parliament. Parliament. Just kidding. Members. Mm. But um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, just kind of, he was in the vote remain party and he just kind of went, when he didn't get it, just went, all oh, right, sort it, I'm going. Bye. Toodaloo. Which is, like, Good I luck. was so shocked. I'm like, can he even do that? Like, are you even allowed to do that? Like, I thought he was a douche already, but now I think he's a mega douche. I hope so, you guys get uh, Boris as Andy your sticks, new prime minister. And he sticks his dick in pig's mouth, so. <laughs> he does. I remember that. <laughs> then we've got Jeremy Corbyn, who looks like Santa if he was homeless. And I think there's two, there, there's two logical options for your next prime minister. Boris Johnson. Oh, God. Or Jacob Rees Mogg. Oh, no, not that idiot. <laughs> Did you guys see that? Jeremy the... Clarkson needs a job. Oh, man, Doesn't could you he's imagine? Got, he's, got new, he's got a new program on Amazon. Yeah, but he would be a better prime minister, I think. I'm definitely leaving. Could you imagine <laughs> if Rob <laughs> Ford were still alive and he were your mayor, Jess, and then. Yes. Trump was president and Boris Johnson was prime minister. I mean, it'd be a circus. See, I'm glad we got like Rob Ford died. We're done. <laughs> we don't have to live through that shit again. Have you Good guys ever seen? You guys. The, have you ever seen the picture of Boris Johnson where he got stuck on a high wire? Yeah, that was on the uh, French magazine uh, the day after Brexit. <laughs> it just put good <laughs> luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but. yeah. If he becomes prime minister, this country's got a shit. <laughs> Seriously, does he have a good chance? Yes. Oh man, that's gonna be because sweet. I think most people who voted for Brexit are 
not really clued in what's going to happen. They're just kind of like, oh, immigration, it's terrible, and we need to close our borders and build a wall like Trump says. You know, I think if we want to summarize all of politics into one little thought is that politicians prey on the misinformation of the voters. And it seems like everybody who voted for Brexit was horribly misinformed. Have you heard about the petition? Yeah, it has three million signatures. Three million signatures to have a second referendum because most people didn't actually bother bloody voting. Well, and or the people that did were like, "Oh, I didn't think it would actually happen." (sighs) I'm gonna vote for this because it'd be funny, and then I could tell my friends like, "Yeah, I voted to exit because it thought it'd be funny." I imagine most people just get the ballot 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 paper and just write in crayon, just (sighs) vote for me. It was so close too. I liked that uh, there was an article that a bunch of people, uh, of tweets from a bunch of people, and the last one was that old lady who's like, I voted to exit because I don't think it's going to hurt us, but I'm kind of worried about our children. Yeah. What a bitch. Like, just because you're going to die soon doesn't mean you should have a little bit of foresight for your upcoming generations. Bunch of idiots. Dan. Hello. Did you vote to exit? I did. No, I vote remain. <laughs> I was trying to call you out. I know. You're calling me an idiot. I get it. Thanks. It wasn't an, I wasn't calling you an idiot. You always call me an idiot. I was not. You're an idiot. Well, I mean, naturally, that's what we built the foundation of this show on. I know. I think we should call it idiot sealed sometimes. Mm. <laughs> so where were you out today, Dan, that you had to rush home? Uh, I went to Newcastle. Do you have a beer? No. No? I do not drink the beer. You don't drink at all, do you? No, I don't. Why? Because I don't want to. We need... I like being dehydrated. We need a WhatsApp chat appearance from Drunk Daniel. (laughs) I haven't been drunk drunk ever, so it's pretty unlikely. Really? I find that shocking. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. So, hold on, let me ask you this if at some point which will probably happen we all link up in las vegas you know for a fact tom and i are getting just plastered jess will probably join i've been with many plastered people so you're gonna be i find it it deeply amusing so you're gonna be our wrangler yeah daniel daycare i will i will have a few drinks but i don't get absolutely off my face off so your funny. face. Will you get off your huh? tits? Possibly. It's happening. <laughs> oh, man. We'll get you drunk, Daniel. Mm, I'll, we'll see. You might have to spike me. <laughs> no, there are laws against that. <laughs> you will break them. <laughs> Maybe uh, in a different country, not here. I don't want to go the route of... But this country is going to be practically post-apocalyptic after two years, so just have, move have there been, you can do what you want. Yeah. Not to keep going back to it, but have there been riots? Not yet. Oh. There's been angry, posh people roaming the streets. Mm-hmm. Come with on. canes? <laughs> with, with canes and Edam in one hand. Oh, shit. <laughs> just wheels of cheese. It's getting mm, real. This country's gone to shit. Hmm. Yeah, this camembert is positively tepid. <laughs> there was... There, I think Tom sent out that tweet from somebody who just wrote, mm, Jeeves, set fire to all the money. <laughs> Very good, sir. <laughs> so good. So, aside... I think it had been... Uh-huh? I was going to say, I think it had been retweeted like a thousand times. As it should have been. That was probably the best tweet to encompass Brexit. Yeah. Now, why did it come up with the term Brexit? I think that is insanely dumb. It sounds like I thought a it breakfast. Was brilliant. No, British exit. Let's just call it Brexit. Like, it's because we yeah. have to abbreviate everything. Because everybody is a moron <laughs> <laughs> who went to that convention that Jess went to. No, that was the one I was at. Oh, was it in Las Vegas? The moron convention. I mean, Jess oh, was right. at oh, one was... too, and then it made its way to Vegas. So everybody just sitting around, duh. basically. Yeah, imagine there was a lot of drool on that floor. <laughs> Just they had to ramp up the uh, sanitation crew. <laughs> we need a whole truckload of mops. We got a lot of drool here. 
<laughs> the, guy, oh, the guy's God. pushing the monster truly. <laughs> Ew, it would smell so bad. Oh, oh God. Dried drool. I hate the smell of dried saliva. Like if you if you're drooling so in your much. sleep and you wake do you up. Often, do you often sniff dried saliva? Yes. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> Jess has weird <laughs> fetishes. Yeah. Salivophilia, I think it's called. That's great. It's called Pina Feckin' Weirdo, that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think it is true. Uh, Daniel. Hello. We played some games this past two weeks. We were off last week because yeah. of you. Brexit. No, 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 no. Pfft. Nobody in the world knew about Brexit till the day it happened. Well, I'm so sorry I that my poor my poor accurate. grandmother was in hospital. Well, I wasn't... Okay. Today we almost <laughs> called off because of you. Last week we called off because you initiated the like, hey, this is inconvenient. And then I'm like, oh yeah, it is because I had shit going on too. So we so were off really last week. Awful too. Oh, I'm terrible. But it actually worked Wonderful. out in our favor because it gave us more time to finish finish the game. And what game did we play? Well, let's get to that later because we played some other games first. We did. We did. We played many games we... because we have launched Factory Sealed YouTube. <gasps> YouTube. C H E W B. YouTube. You're a turb. Just eat up that content. No. Get it. Get it. Get it. Yes. Get it. So even though we didn't do the podcast last week, we have started doing stupid videos. Continued doing stupid videos. Yes. Stupid on YouTube. They are, they are very stupid as well. We figured we would try our hand at a, another Batman game. Oh, God. We did well. We really didn't. I think, I honestly <laughs> think we did better at Batman, was it forever? Oh, God. I don't think we did. I think we did. So we decided to play The Adventures of Batman and Robin on the Sega Genesis. We did. There is video evidence of how bad we are at this game. And I think it's this actually... a very difficult game. I think I'm worse at it. Yeah, because you spent about half an hour not actually trying and throwing batarangs at the floor. Well, that floor was looking kind of shady. <laughs> it gave me a tilted glance. Like, I don't like the cut of your jib floor. And you stayed on the upper level where there was no enemies that just left me to it. Well, you were doing so well. I just wanted to test your metal. Yeah, okay. And then what I had guy. to I had to really swing from those canopies. <laughs> I had to test it's not as good swinging from the canopies on Batman <laughs> Forever. That was hilarious. So what is the adventures of Batman and Robin or Ratman and Bobbin? It's based on the... Um, second series of Batman, the animated series, which was called The Adventures of Batman and Robin in European territories, I think. But possibly not in America. I think it was. I mean, I, I vaguely remember a TV show that looked right. like It's that. like um, Batman Beyond is called Batman of the Future in Europe for some reason. What's Batman Beyond? When Batman is in the future. So wouldn't it just be Batman? Of the future. Mm -hmm. Because it's a different Batman. Future Batman. Yeah. Future Man. It's called Terry McGinnis. Who? Bruce Wayne is practically dead. Terry McGinnis. Uh huh. What's that? Is that like Ronnie Pickering? <laughs> Who are you? I'm Terry <laughs> McGinnis, you flick. Who? <laughs> Who's that? Me! Terry oh McGinnis. my god, I'm dying. <laughs> Wrong time to take a sip of the drink. Oh, I thought like you were physically dying, like <laughs> no, because yeah. I didn't I hear have, any had laughing. Had time, <laughs> no, mm -hmm, guys, just to let you know, I'm expiring now. I'm dying right now. Mm -hmm. Call someone. No, not until the house sells. Did Don't you have that. to list in your house selling that you have a creeper peeper who stares through the windows? <laughs> no, comes with not. complimentary stalker. Complimentary stalker who may or may not be jacking it. We're not sure. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> you may want to give the uh, side of the house a good wash down. <laughs> Ghosts frequently the the house, attack the, the the side walls. Our house looks like it's been attacked by a ghost. Mm, conveniently I it was just painted stucco. off. Aw. Oh. That'd be concerning. Our house smells like stalker sperm and <laughs> steel drill. <laughs> <laughs> just those buyers are going to be rushing in. I know, right? I mean, don't they have clauses where if somebody gets murdered in your house, you have to disclose that? Or if there is some sort of demonic possession? Only if it was a violent death. I looked this up. Huh. <laughs> those, bod- those bodies you have under the floorboards are pretty much... They weren't violent. They were sleeping. <laughs> No one's going to buy my house now. <laughs> no, they're not. Well, I don't think the real estate market in Toronto is very uh, retro game <laughs> podcast savvy. Oh, I'm going to be stuck at my parents' house forever. Go to the um, house and go, um, how many dead bodies have you got under the film pots? I need at least four. <laughs> <laughs> a plan to resurrect them. <laughs> For I am a witch. Yeah. Daniel. Hello. Take us back to Batman and Robin before we get too sidetracked with uh, very dangerous things. Dick, yeah, unusual that was, that was a, an unusual segue. Yeah. Um, what well, is this we, game? We have we haven't described what it is yet. It's kind of a side-scrolling beat 'em up for the Genesis. And I don't like beat 'em ups. I just flat out don't. don't. I think the only one I can really tolerate is. The Turtles in Time and the Simpsons ones from Arcade. Oh, I love the Simpsons arcade game. I actually played through all of that in the arcade one day. How broke we are you? We played it a few years ago, didn't we? No. I the swear Simpsons, we did. The arcade machine was broken. And every time you got to continue, you didn't have to pay. So I sat and played through the entire thing <laughs> about six hours. Oh my gosh. It always amazed me granny. that they put games that were that long in the arcade. I know. Like, House of the Dead. Has anybody ever finished House of the Dead? Well, that game's not that long. Yeah, but you, chances are you probably die before you get to the end, and then most people go, I'm not paying for that. I mean, like Time Crisis, for example. I had Time Crisis 2 on PS2 with the light guns and everything, and my buddy and I could get through it in 20 minutes. The whole game, 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, those are perfect arcade-length games. But we would die a ton. But you can still get through you it. You always do. You always do. I think they're skewed in that way, aren't they? So you... Money, money, money. Have you actually played through any of the House of the Dead games not in arcade? I think... You know what? I think I have played through all of House of the Dead 2 in arcade because I was with a guy who was really, really drunk and just kept putting money in it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you don't drink. You just hang out yeah, with drunk people. Yeah, because you can just exploit people. Yeah. <laughs> We had uh, House of the Dead 2 on Dreamcast. That game, it's phenomenally fun, but holy shit, the acting is bad. Oh, yeah. It's meant to be. House of the Dead 3 was my favorite. It's the shotgun. You ever played that one? Uh, I don't know. You actually have a shotgun controller, which has like the pump action reload, so you don't have to shoot off the screen. You just pump, pump oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Those are so fun. You feel like such a badass all the time. And then House of the Dead 4 has an Uzi. Uzi. Oh, really? then you could get the some of the really higher class arcades had the Uzis that had like the haptic feedback and they would shake when you'd shoot them. Yeah. Oh, did I tell you about the House of the Dead I played in Japan? I think you did, but recap for us. It was um, it was like an interactive one. You get sat in a seat and then it would swing you around and blast you with air and stuff as you were playing. Why would you really be cool. sitting was... down? Because it was like it was like a ride. It was two screens. There was one in front of you, one behind you. Then whenever the camera would turn around, the, the chairs would turn around as well. Really? Yeah. I think it's I'd awesome. get sick. So good. So There's fun. one arcade game that I played that actually made me ill. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a flight sim game that had 
a complete 180 dome in front of you. Like it went down from your from the bottom of your feet up to the top of your head, and then um, from the left side of your from your left ear all the way around to your right ear. So it was like a, half of a sphere sitting in front of you. And when you would move the joysticks, the seat that you were in would would move as well. And there was just too much shit going on. And it was the only game that I've actually considered just walking away from, but I put two bucks into it to play it. Like, I should probably finish this. I had to sit down for about 20 minutes after. Vomited everywhere. Oh, it was awful. Sounds so fun, stubborn. No. I'm going to finish this if I puke all over everything. I'm just going to put it out of commission for everyone. But you, you say you didn't like beat most, but you enjoyed Streets of Ridge too. Well, yes, I did. Because we were inserting turkeys and coins into things that probably should not have accepted either of those objects. But they give you health, so you got to do it. You got to do it. Eh, that's true. I mean, this game was on Batman and Robin was unnecessarily difficult. It is a very difficult. I remember really struggling with it as a kid. I don't know how you could get through any of it single player. I think trial and error. To be honest, did they tone down the enemy output on single player? I don't think so. Ugh. Yeah, it, it was just... Basically, it was... basically, anyway, just to give people a, a full backdrop of this, this is either a single-player or two-player beat-em-up for the Genesis where you can play as Batman and Robin. And uh, you basically go through side-scrolling levels, loads of enemies get thrown in. you very difficult. There's two, usually two levels you can go on. And uh, then you have to get to the end of the level, fight a mini-boss who was ridiculously difficult, go on to another level with more difficult enemies, another mini-boss, then through another section to get to the final boss of the level. And it's so difficult. Me and Eric got through two of the stages. We didn't get it even to the first end of the first level. It was spectacular how terrible we were. It was, it's quite a difficult game, though. Oh, it's very difficult. I would say it's probably the hardest beat 'em up I've played. I would agree with that. But if you can get past that, it is a lot of fun. Oh. Did you see the video of the game that Tom and I played the other day? Which one was that? Pocky and Rocky 2. I have not watched that one yet, actually. I'm afraid. So we were looking for obscure multiplayer games. And... You some... found them. Yeah. This game... Oh, man. I wish Tom were here to tell you about this. This game is insane. It is one of the most fun multiplayer games I've played in a long time. It's interesting how they handle the multiplayer so Pocky and Rocky is is a kind of a cross between a beat-em-up and like your old um vertical scrolling shooter games like uh 1943 or you know side scrolling like Galaga because that's you're just moving from the bottom of the screen to the top and then enemies are coming towards you but you're you play as this little girl and her companion sidekick who is out to save the village we skip through the story because the story happens to other people. Um, so I don't really know why we need to save the village. We just need to save the village. But her sidekick, her main sidekick, is a Japanese Tanuki, which most people would know from Mario 3. However, Mario 3 did not represent the Tanuki properly. This game does. You guys know what a Tanuki is, right? Weird creature. It, with a fluffy tail. Mm, uh, kind of. Uh, a tanuki, traditional Japanese tanuki, is a raccoon like animal whose main defining feature is the exaggerated oh size of God. his nutsack. So cute. I didn't see pictures of his back end. This. No, no, no. It's not his back end. I meant his nutsack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are great. Can I have one? This is They're a tanuki. Awesome. Huge balls. Oh, my God. I thought those were legs. No, those are his balls. Oh, my God. It changes forever how you play Mario 3 when you get the tanuki suit. So like, well, where is nuts? <gasps> no, shut up. <laughs> No. <laughs> Goodbye, childhood. That is the third image on Google. <laughs> no. One up. One up. One up. 
Oh my god. <laughs> the third image when you Google Tanuki <laughs> is Princess Peach being done up the backside by somebody else in a Tanuki suit. Oh dear. Um so this game is it, it's meant to be single player where you're this little girl who has magical abilities and you can throw these cards. You just you have an infinite deck of cards that you throw at enemies and you can at some point have your sidekick take control of you, your sidekick you then control. Um, they have special powers. However, if you're playing two player, one person controls a little girl, the other person controls the sidekick. And you just progress through the level. We made it to halfway through the second one. The first boss is insanely difficult. It took us probably seven tries to get through. Um, wow. But the coolest attack in the game, the little girl can press R and throw the sidekick. So there's the Tanuki. There's a giant guy like Hamburger Bob who throws explosive hamburgers. And then I don't remember the other one. There's three sidekicks. Anyway, he would always oh, that, play. That he, Tanuki really does have a giant nuts. He would play. I'm just watching some gameplay. He would play as the Tanuki. And when you throw him, when you throw the sidekick, it does their special ability. And Pocky, no, Rocky, the Tanuki, would transform into a giant 2D sprite Tanuki and just sit on people with his nutsack and cause <laughs> insane amounts of damage. Wow. This game is so weird. It was an absolute blast. It is one of the most fun games we've played together. It's oh. rock hard. It is super difficult. I mean, that, that first boss that we fought against was this old lady that threw out knives, but she progressed. As you damaged her, she has like six or seven candles for health. And as you take one away, she changes her attack patterns. And when she gets down to three left... She becomes very difficult and moves around a lot. And you don't personally have a health meter. You just kind of die. And the sidekick can get hit about twice before they disappear. And then there's a little bit of a respawn time for them to come back. So as long as the main character is alive, the, the sidekick can keep coming back. So is Tom controlling the sidekick? Yeah. But if I would, th- strange. If I would throw him and miss, then it would consider him killed and have to go through the respawn time. Wow, you get killed a lot in this game. <laughs> it is so difficult. It really looks difficult. But man, is it fun. We had it's interesting s- how you can fire the cards in all eight directions. Yeah. It's, it, it's one of the games you just have to play. It looks a lot of fun. Oh, we were just nice. having a riot playing it. We were trying to play Pocky and Rocky 1, but we couldn't get that to work. So we're like, well, let's just jump to 2 and hope we understand what the hell's going on. The worst part of this game, at the very beginning, they said, would you like some lessons in how to do things? He said no. We said yes. (laughs) On accident. And it took 15 minutes to get through the tutorial. Did you say on accident? Yes, I meant to say no. I don't want somebody to teach me how to play it. But do you say on accident or by accident? I say by accident. I say by accident as well, Jesse. He's just an idiot. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to deal not insulting each other. Um, it took you through the basics of the game, like traditional tutorials will say, hey, here's how you do this. And, you know, like a first-person shooter, they come across a, a fallen branch and you press B to go under it. Well, if modern games took a page from Pocky and Rocky, you'd have to go under 15 branches before they made sure you understood how to crouch. Oh, my like, God. Like any retro Zelda, then. It was insane. It's like, hey, here's how you shoot your cards. Okay, you have to kill 15 enemies before you can move on. And then the next one was like, okay, here's your magic wand. Oh, by the way, you need to press this button. You need to kill 15 enemies before we'll let you move on. It was so frustrating. That's so annoying. At least it's prepping you for the game. It really didn't. Oh, okay then. Because we were just angry that we had to keep going. Well, maybe if you paid attention, you wouldn't have sucked as much. No, the game's real hard. 
real hard. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend Pocky and Rocky too. You can see a video of it on our YouTube. What is the YouTube, Eric? Do we have a link yet? Uh, it does not have a dedicated URL yet. URL. I think you have to have a certain amount of subscribers to get a dedicated URL. Busted. Yeah. So you can just... Is the link on the website? Oh, I don't think we have it on oh. our website. We'll throw a link up on the website, factory-sealed.com. You can find our YouTube. Eric will forget about that, and I'll remind him to do it, and then he'll do it in about two weeks. So look out for that. Okay. I need to go back to this picture that you sent, <laughs> Jess. Yeah. Are it's those his up. nuts slung that over he's... his shoulder? Correct. It looks like there's three. I know. Does he have a tri ball? I don't know. You're the one who played this game. Well, this <laughs> isn't from Pocky and Rocky. I know. Um, no, I think it's just like a crease in the middle. It was a spectacular testicle. So I didn't even notice that the first time. I thought this, it was just hair. This would be a great wall print to hang because most people wouldn't understand what they're looking at. They're like, oh, he's probably yeah. just got like a sack full of cheese or something. Until the last minute, <laughs> and then you can cheese. never unsee it. <laughs> the reason I say cheese, Dan, is because when my uncle lived in Australia, he oh, sent no. me a care package. And one thing he sent me was a kangaroo testicle coin purse. Nice. And on the back, it said, do not store cheese in here. That was the only <laughs> warning on it. Like You could store Ew. anything else you wanted, but just don't put cheese in this leather kangaroo nut sack. No, you, you don't want cheese in your nut sack. No. You don't want cheese That's on so your nut sack either. Anywhere near it, just no. Uh, uh, Ugh. 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 Anyway, while we're still on the subject of um, the YouTube, we actually have put a lot of our older videos up on there, as well as our new ones. So we've got quite a few. The infamous Batman Forever. The infamous Batman Forever video, of course. And we played Barbie Supermodel. Yeah. Yeah. And Are Real Monsters, that was a good one. No, that game is Mega Pants, I think is the exact <laughs> terminology that we used. Uh, King of the Monsters, where we had a throw down and destroyed most of Tokyo, that was a good one. That was fun. <laughs> Bounced off the ropes, if I remember rightly. Uh, Mega Man X with incredible lag, that was a good one. Well, maybe we should play through it again without the lag, because you have yeah. semi-not-shit internet anymore. Yeah, I do. Uh, Road Rash 2, where we decided to just jump off the bikes and run for the entire race. <laughs> yes. Uh, Wild Guns, where we sucked big style, I believe. Oh, big, big style. True um, Lies, where we accidentally destroyed the world with nuclear fire. Because we uh, sacrificed the lives of three waiters. <laughs> <laughs> Abort mission! The um, Streets of Rage 2 video where we ingested turkeys and coins into our crotches. Yes. Uh, the King of Dragons. That was a good one. Yes. Side-scrolling beat em up that one, Oh, no, that That's is a, a good one. Yeah, you like that too. I so did you like, do like that one. one. As long as we it's not attempted, shit. We attempted Battletoads and Battle Maniacs and did terribly. Ugh. Uh, so, Evo Search for Eden. Oh, that was a good game. It was. It got a little grindy that, towards the end. Yeah, it did. It was good. It was unique. Unikai. Uh, what else we play? Tom has done a video where he plays through June for the Amiga, is it? June? Like the month? June. Dune, sorry. Yeah, Dune. <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have a video where me and you tried to defuse bombs. D- did we put that up? Oh, yeah. Nobody explodes. Oh, my God. That one's crazy. It's so stressful. <laughs> it's a fun game. I just I think we should tell people this. What Cape Town and Nobody Explodes is kind of one person has a manual where they know how to defuse a bomb and the other person does not have this manual. And the person who has the manual has to describe how to defuse the bomb to the person. But you are meant to play this with people in the same room. Me and Eric played it transatlantically. Yes. Well, it's, so, I guess that works just as well because I'm looking at the computer screen. I have to describe to you what I see on the bomb. And then the manual is written in such a way that it's not very easy to discern what modules you're looking at. 
Yeah, but I think you meant to print off the manual, and I just had it on my screen, so I was scrolling down. <laughs> you could have done like as long as there's no lag, you should be good. Oh yeah, but it was very stressful. It was. It's Dan. We uh, I think for the final video we should talk about, which is our game of the week as well. So it's a beautiful segue into this. Well, before we segue into that, hold that. Can we put segues on hold? Like, is that a thing? Yes, mm. segues are on put hold. Put a pin in it. Yeah, park it. Just for a second. We uh, put out a, a message on Facebook asking you what games you want to see us be really bad at. And uh, we got some response for like Power Rangers, the movie, um, Bubble Bath Babes, which is like... Oh, bubble Bath, I know what Bubble Bath Babes is. Yeah. Yes. Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. <laughs> and then Eric Mischenfelder felt it necessary to suggest Goof Troop. I don't Which, know how you feel about that it's one. It's beautiful. No. Ugh. No. <laughs> and then uh, the other video on YouTube that I think Check. everybody needs to watch is so good. Ricky, Retro Ricky, the guy who won the Jeeves box, did an unboxing video. So if you want to see everything that was in the Jeeves box, check it out. We did put it up on our Facebook page. Um, it's like the fourth or fifth post down right now, but it is a fantastic video. It's so Ricky, we loved putting the packaging on your head. That was genius. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. What would Factory Seal do? I'll be dumb as possible, yes. So, I just loved how much Ricky appreciated it as well. It was great. It was such a good video. Yes. Sorry for the overly posh letter that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, that was the poshest letter in the world. <laughs> Well, I thought about it. I read some, I read some letters that the Queen had written to get some inspiration for this. <laughs> oh my God! And they are the most long, drawn out, convoluted sentences you can imagine. So the whole first chunk is a paragraph long, but it's one sentence, perfectly structured. Wow. Well done. Yeah. You do the grammar well. Uh, do, do do the grammar well. Grammar is so hard. Back to that segue. <laughs> yep. Continue on with it. I can't even remember what we're talking about. Something about perfect segues for videos. Oh, there's not a perfect segue anymore. Of the game that we played this week. Yeah, Beautifully constructed. The moment. Well, I'm segueing the segue back to the segue. I'm segueing the, the segue away from the segue back to the segue. Oh, shit. I didn't even know that was possible. Anyway, we played Landstalker this week, mm -hmm. for the past two weeks, in fact, but we have debuted a brand new video concept from called Factory Seal Players, where basically me, Eric, and Tom did it for the first video, where we all play the same game separately for half an hour, and after that, we blend all of the best bits into a montage, and what came out was spectacular. <laughs> Spectacularly shit. Just it, was it was so good. Jess, Jess was even in the video. She didn't get past the title screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's so inaccurate. Just throwing that out there. Oh, it's as far as you would have gotten anyway. Shh. I mean, in a stroke of sheer brilliance, that is one of the funniest things Tom has ever done. Yeah. I'm very impressed. Besides, what did he... He compared something to Hitler that just brought the house down. <laughs> Can't remember that one. He's made me giggle a good laugh a good few times. I will be honest. But anyway. um, that, video, that video is spectacular. What is so bizarre about it is how similarly we do things, all and three of us. The comments that we make in the same spots... It's, it's great. There's this bit where we all fall off a waterfall and fall onto the ground, and then this character comes from nowhere and goes, "Oh my gosh, a man!" <laughs> and we all do it. We all say, "Oh my gosh, a man!" in the stupidest voice as possible. Well, that the the title screen. Not only do we all go Landstalker, and then as we're watching the opening cutscene when Landstalker pops up, we all do it again. Yeah, I know. I think this the, continues all, all the, the way through the video. One of my favorite bits because you guys are basic bitches. Let's be honest. Yeah, well, duh, I was drinking my pumpkin spice latte and my Uggs. 
Uh, right now, it is the Samoras Frappuccino, which is the hot oh, shit. 600 calories in a drink. Uh, get fat. Get, 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 <laughs> get, get some weight. <laughs> Well, my favourite bit, Eric, is where you're trying, you're going down a straight corridor and you keep walking at the wall and you just get really annoyed. <laughs> it's like, fine, look at it. <laughs> Stop looking at the wall. <laughs> the best bit is when Tom could not figure out how to utilize the door and just left the dungeon. <laughs> he has a key. He's standing in front of the door, couldn't figure out how to open the door, leaves the entire dungeon. Is that really that surprising, though? Like, he has Jeeves in real life to open every single door for him. I, I'm going to give him true. some, cut him some slack on that one. Doesn't even know what a key is. <laughs> it's... Why, why, why isn't this opening? I don't understand. Jeeves, use your magical powers to open the doorway. Thank you all. <laughs> what is a doorknob? How do I turn it? <laughs> doesn't do anything. Tommy doesn't even walk. Where's the red carpet? Jeeves, push me around. Jeeves, wipe my ass, please. Thank you all. <laughs> well, I'm standing up. <laughs> okay, so Landstalkor. Landstalkor. An action adventure slash role playing game for the Sega Genesis. And while it is extremely off putting at the very beginning, is a fantastic game once you dig into it. Uh, I- Go ahead. Yeah, well, the first thing we have to mention is the controls of this bloody game. Well, I think the controls oh, are compounded in awfulness by the decision to do an isometric, angled, pseudo-3D, top-down-ish view. So yeah. Every, yeah, I completely agree. Every screen is a square, but instead of it being, you know, you're looking it's flat across the top it's like a diamond so that doesn't line up with how the controller is with up down left right so you're constantly holding angled directions on the controller to go any direction and they really made heavy use of platforming in this and since it's not an actual 3d game it's like impossible to judge where to jump. Yeah, there could be a block that looks like it's directly in front of you, but it's actually down into the right seven squares. It's so difficult. I don't know how people play through this game without save states. It would be impossible. Oh, I have no idea. Um, the game itself revolves around an elf named Nigel. <laughs> Stupidest <laughs> <Nigel>. name. <laughs> And his his if set a fantasy setting with a fairy called Fair called Friday. Yeah. And he's called Nigel. Nigel and Friday are on a quest searching for clues to uncover the hidden treasure of King Knoll. It is actually called Landstalker, the treasures of King Knoll as well. Yes. Just throw that out there. It is the the best comparison is this is a Zelda clone. It's an isometric 3D action adventure Zelda clone is essentially what this game is. Yeah, basically all the combat is in real time with slash attacks in any direction and you can jump and things like that. But you that you get no other weapons other than your sword, so um, it keeps it pretty simplistic. So it does. How do we want to tackle this, Dan? Because there's so much in here. Well, it's first true. of all, I need to ask, did you finish it? I did not. Oh, no. Where did you get up You're to? the worst. I, so last night, I had a buddy. It was his birthday, so he ended up coming over, and we played like seven hours of Smash Brothers and, that, and drank just a ton of beer. Um, so I did not get a chance to finish it. That's the shame. Yeah, I got th- halfway through the final dungeon, so I'm close. Is the final dungeon the cave or the dungeon after that? There's a dungeon. I'm in King Knoll's castle. But it's a cavey. You said you got the Sword of Gaia, right? Yeah, that's where I was. Yeah, there's another dungeon after Ugh. that. <laughs> but that you were about a quarter of the way through that dungeon at that point. How long is the the dungeon after that? Extremely long. Ugh. I'm... 
I don't know. Do you want to do this in chronological order? Or can I mention the puzzle at the end? No, let's, let's just go through it. But I think there's a more pressing question at hand here first, and it's directed towards Jess. Do you want me to ask it, or do you just want to answer it? I didn't even start it. Because oh. I'm getting divorced, Eric. Actually. Oh, shit. You are going to play that card, aren't you? What? Jess you- is pulling back that curtain. Yeah. I know, right? Wow. I, I dropped it early. It was Jess, I Jess is now that Jess is now available. Send in your best <laughs> wooing lines. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> no, I didn't even a fan I, of droolers. I didn't even start it. So Tom's video was inaccurate. Oh man, Oops. so Tom should have just had a black screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he gave me a little bit more credit oh. than I deserved. No, we're gonna to have to edit it now, I'm afraid. Well, you can still provide thoughtful insight and questions while Dan and I discuss the absurdity of Landstalker. Quite. Mm, yes, that sounds quite shit. Well, one of the one of the things that struck me first about this game is Nigel is on the opening cutscene. He's shown to be going through a, a cave and he finds a treasure, and he comes back and sells it and gets quite a lot of golds with an S monies. Yeah, and, uh, Cash, and then please. then some fairy woman turns up and just says, I'm looking for some treasures of King Noel, and then he just goes, all right, I'll come with. And then the next thing you know, they're on the back of a giant eagle flying. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, wow, that's uh, that's odd. <laughs> so strange. Yeah, the, Does he have then... a bicycle? No. Oh, bicycle. One thing, oh, no, he has boots that look like bicycle, kind of. Yeah, his feet are abnormally large. Maybe yeah. that's it. It's, he has a weird marching motion when he moves. It's kind of It is very important odd. to note that this game is a direct inspiration of Alundra for the PlayStation. It's basically the prequel. Okay. So if you've played Alundra or heard me talk about it, Alundra and Landstalker are tied together. I don't know if they are story-wise. I definitely don't think so because none of the story elements from this game carry over, but yeah. What Landstalker for me, though, Eric, all together has been an experience of so many different emotions because it's been I <laughs> hated it to start with. I enjoyed the middle. I hated another section, enjoyed it a bit more after that. And I absolutely have never been so frustrated from a game as the end two dungeons. My God. I don't know how you can That's physically tr- oh, go ahead, Jess. I was going to say i couldn't tell that there are a lot of emotions when i would check my whatsapp and there'd be like 200 messages that i missed all bitching about, about landstock land or <laughs> yeah. i have to paint they're having way more fun no they weren't yeah it's yeah, it just seriously it's just so stressful towards the end it's so unfairly designed it's unbelievable i don't know how anybody could physically get through it without a walkthrough i just don't yeah, but the people who w- wrote the walkthroughs for this game, are, I'm convinced, slightly retarded. <laughs> the the two main ones that you can find on GameFAQs, they just openly say, like, I'm not going to cover everything because I don't feel like it. Like, well, that's the point of a walkthrough. <laughs> it's like, it's just so confusingly written. There's one which actually has paragraphs, but it's so confusingly written you can't follow it. Then the other one has paragraphs which are about 20 lines long. Yeah, and you can't actually physically read. I actually had both, <laughs> but open. the door wouldn't open. I had both open at once, and I'm cross referencing them because there'd be bits of information that one would put in, and the other would leave out. So if you meshed those two together, it would be okay. Oh, not towards the end. No, oh, the end is just insane. Um, so the game kicks off, like you said, with Nigel and Friday heading out to find treasures of King Knoll, but along the way you meet up with other people who are looking for the same thing and they kind of become your antagonist within the story. And they're just always a couple steps ahead of you. And in the process, you discover this giant plot with the Duke of the main city who is extorting his people, as far as I can understand, extorting his people and driving the land into ruin. Basically, you go to his castle and he tasks you with going to a tower to kill this um, evil wizard, apparently. But the, in reality, the evil wizard is his brother and the duke is the bad one. 
who banished the evil brother because he didn't want to take part in his evil ploys. Correct. Yes. So he's a good guy? Yes. The, the evil wizard that you're tasked with killing is a good guy, yes. Shit. Yeah. Twist. twist. But what, what really stood out for me again with this is I thought I had a good grasp of the controls, but then you get to somewhere <laughs> like the section called Green Maze, oh. where it's just, just, I don't know what they were thinking when they designed this section. This is the bit where I got annoyed again, because Green Maze, as the name suggests, is a maze made of trees in an isometric game where you can barely see where you're going. Oh, that's so and annoying. And then they would have... Has, they would it have... has about 50 different screens to get through. There'd be hills oh that you could, you could walk behind the hills or the trees and not know where you're going to pop out. If you're on a ledge and you jump off, you don't know where you're going to land and you might land in the wrong spot and then have to backtrack 15 screens to get back to where you were. Yep. I got right, to the, I got right to the end and you have to remove some trees, right? So I didn't have what you needed to remove these trees, so I had to go back to the beginning, find a dog which the was Einstein dead. The Einstein whistle. And revive it using an item called an Eki Eki, as I called them. Yep. Eric went for Eek Eek. No, I went for a Kiki. Did you? <laughs> and um, yeah, you had to revive this dog, take him to meet his master, who was um, a woodcutter. And you had to then call the dog when you need these trees. So the woodcutter would come and cut down the trees. So I, sp- I would say I spent about three hours in that place. And that's annoying because you're holding like you're that would be the diagonal too, right? So it's yeah. not like you could oh. even count steps really nicely. Yes, we haven't even said the actual difficulty of getting through doorways and into other screens on this game is incredible. Yeah, it's even, super hard. Even towards the end, I was still struggling. Like sometimes you just you will not go the right way and you will fall off a ledge. Why would they do that? I do, it's so cruel. It's so difficult. But there's control. that there's a there's a certain magic within it that just makes you want to keep playing it. I mean, I think you and I each probably put fifteen hours into this game. I think I've done more to be honest. I put I, I, all told because the last sections took me so long. I spent all day yesterday finishing off the last two dungeons. Yeah, they're insane. Um, and then. The first few well, I'm dungeons. Glad I didn't start it. The first few dungeons aren't really that hard. It's not until after you get to Mercator. But I think it's important in Mercator to talk about a certain men's club that you come across. Oh yeah. So you come into this city, and there's this building that you're not allowed into. You see children, little boys, peeking through the window, and everybody is talking about. Um, Oh, shoot. What's her name? Do you remember? Lady... Oh, I don't, to be honest. Oh, it's going to drive me Rolls nuts. Rolls or something? I don't know. Rolls. Well, anyway, there's this lady who runs this spa, as everybody refers to it. And they will not let you in because you're not old enough. So, you can go and see this fortune teller who then transforms... You, Nigel, a mid-teens elf of pale skin, to an elderly Middle Eastern-looking man. And then you walk into the brothel and they go, oh, you want to join? Cool. First session is free. Enjoy. But as you're walking in, you can talk to another guy who's coming out and going, oh, man, I'm exhausted. I need to go home and and, uh, practice what I learned today. And the whole thing just alludes to, like, this is nothing but a sex house, just a huge brothel. Well, I've just done some investigation, and I have trivia. Uh Uh-oh. Madam Yard's Pink Palace, in brackets brothel, was renamed to Ballet Studio for North American and European territories. So it was originally meant to be a brothel. Oh, yeah. And there was also a scene cut out where Kayla is taking a bath. Nigel can either join or try to leave her, but in the end, he will be beaten by Friday or Kayla's henchman. That's awesome. In the North American and European versions, the scene was cut. Script and dialogue for the scene are present and translated in Cartridge's data, but a maid was added in front of a door so that Ryle forward slash Nigel can't get into the room where the scene happens. Wait, his name was originally Ryle? Apparently. That's a much better name. I know. 
Why would you switch? I've it? also just found out that this has a follow-up game called Lady Stalker. No, Lady Stalker Challenge from the Past. <gasps> we have to play this. What was it on? Super Nintendo. We have to play it. We do. It looks you can't so- jump. It actually looks kind of cheesy. It looks like Harvest Moon. Mm. Anyway. So we were correct in assuming that this is a brothel. Yes. But you get but upstairs it's, and realize it's like, that... It's so stupidly translated, isn't it? So it just seems like a brothel even though they say it isn't. <laughs> well, you oh get my a- god. The artwork for the Lady Stalker is a high heel and a sword. That's amazing. It stars, it stars that guy who jacks it outside Jess's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? The, We're not supposed to say that. People won't buy my house. When you get upstairs and actually talk to Lady oh, yes. Yard and r- reveal it's a ballet studio, she tries to give this half-assed explanation as to why little boys can't come in. And it's something to the effect of uh, the stresses that ballet puts on your body would break a little boy. <laughs> Correct. It's like, Wow! Yeah, it's, a, it's some pretty dark stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, who are the people? Kayla, there's there's these random people that just show up a couple times at the beginning, two-thirds of the game, and then they just disappear. Like, I'm assuming their plot points are never resolved. They're not. They just disappear. They're never shown again. It's this trio of bandits who are constantly trying to get in your way. Kayla and... I don't it's remember. a frog thing and a weird beast thing. I don't know what the names are. Yeah. Um. So we talked about Green Maze. There were a bunch of really... I think I th- Go ahead. I think we should mention the um, the life system in this one. Oh, basically, yeah. You, basically, you start off with about four hearts or something, don't you? Four uh, or five? Yeah. And now you can keep... By getting to chests and stuff, you can collect items called life stocks. These put your health up, but I also noticed as you collect them, it seems to up your strength as well. I don't think that was the case. I think it's it as is, you get honestly, the different swords. No, it's not because I was watching a playthrough on YouTube where somebody had the ultimate sword and they had 82 life stocks. I only had 64. And the ultimate sword, basically, when you charge attacks up, it does like a rain of boulders, which damage every enemy in the room. Because is that with he the Gaia sword? Life- Yes, oh. and he had more he had more life stocks than me. So every time he would do that attack, it would kill most enemies in the room. Whereas it would still take me about five hits to kill them. Interesting. I think by the time I stopped, I had fifty nine life stocks. I had about sixty seventy towards the end, but most playthroughs that people were doing with that about eighty by this point. So I think I made it more difficult than it had to be. I think there's over a hundred. And there's a, special, find, there's a special item called a bell that if you purchase for 850 golds, it gives you a message when there's a life stock near. Oh, is there? Mm-hmm. There's also an item called a pawn ticket where you can um, sap your health and it gives you gold. Huh. So, so I'm it, not sure if you can exploit this and keep going to an inn and sleeping and then getting your health down, getting more gold. It took me... Well, I'm sure they wouldn't give you enough to offset that because most hotels were 20 bucks a night. Yeah, but because of... The, this gives you about 50 gold per heart. So if you've got oh. 80 life stocks, you can deplete them all down to two or one, go oh. to an inn, sleep, get loads of gold. How many pawn tickets do, can you hold? Just one? Just one, I think. But I, I don't know if you can reuse it. How long did it take you to... Um understand the uh health recovery system oh um well i I know it was after the first time i got an e-cake that when i died it it revived so i was like then i noticed the number went down so pretty quickly actually because as soon as i would get low on health i thought those numbers next to my health were like my continues or something um Mm -hmm. so i would get low on health and i'd use the ekis to revive or to to heal myself but then after I started, after I realized they just revive you automatically, I never bothered healing myself. Yeah, but this is again a thing with this game because 
it's so difficult. The controls are so difficult, and it's quite easy to lose health. That when you basically when you run out of Eki, because it's game over if you die. So, but the save points of this game are very few and far between. You can only save at churches in each town, which you're not in towns very often. And then no. some dungeons have a Grim Reaper in like a, a, a miniature chapel that you can save at. And that's it. I think I saved four times the whole game. Yeah, me too. But even saving on this game is difficult because you have to go and pick up a book and take it to the podium and put it in front of him for him to see oh, it. Oh, if you want to go to the shop tools. and you want to purchase nine Iki Ikis, you have to buy one, leave the shop, come back in, go through all the text again, pick it up, put it on the counter, buy it, leave, go through all the text again. It's super long. But and there is because, a lady... Because each time you have to navigate actually getting through the doorway, it's yeah. just even more difficult. There was a lady outside at the, uh, the port of Mercator that would have three Ikis outside and you could buy three at a time. Yeah, she was a nice lady. We liked her. Yes. Um, there was a... Uh, in one of the dungeons, there was a Grim Reaper that had Ikis that you could just pick up for free. They didn't cost anything. So you'd go in, pick one up, leave, come back, pick one up, leave, come back, pick one up, leave, and until you were full. Yes, there was. Jessica. Eric. Okay. I believe you have to uh, announce something. Because here I'm com- getting a puppy? No, because here comes the bus. I'm going to buy PS4 with divorce money. Are you? Yeah. Whoa. Oh, finally. I know, right? That's cushioned the blow a bit. Divorce money. Like, know, you're just going to, they pay you to get divorced these days? Yeah, they don't in America. Mm, no, we just sue everyone. Oh, no, when we sell our house, mm, get some. Yes. So, um, oh, I have to leave. <laughs> wow. How long will it be till Jessica stays for a whole show? Next time. At least it's not the hundredth episode. You'll never get back from that one. Never. No. I have a bridal shower. Okay. Well, oh, enjoy. How incredibly important. Good thing you didn't play this game. I know. That's why I didn't feel that bad. No. <laughs> yeah, I'll get my shit together for we next. We promise week. we won't make fun of you very much. At that's least a lie. Not until you leave. That's truthful. No, that's true. Okay. Bye, Jess. Goodbye. Bye, Jess. What a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, back to Landstalker. 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 Did you do many of the optional side missions? No. For example, there is one where you become a dog. I know. I read about this. And I was like, I'm not doing that. I don't know how it happened. But I became a dog, and I looked at how you had to do it, and it's just the most random series of events. So outside of, of Mercator, there is a witch's house. Well, basically, you have to get the Einstein whistle that just lets you communicate with dogs first, don't you? Yes. Yeah, so this is after Green Maze. You walk into this witch's house, and then when you come back with the Einstein whistle, you can talk to this dog, and the dog is talking about wanting to see a bell. And you figure it's an item. But there's another dog back in Masan, the very first village, named Bell. So if you go all the way back there, which there isn't a very intuitive fast travel system. We'll get to that in a second. Um, if you go all the way back to Masan and talk to this dog, and then go all the way back to the witch's hut and talk to this dog again, you'll transform into a dog because the dog will realize, like, oh, hey, here's my, here's my Bell. And then the witch goes, ah, whatever, you're trying to thwart my... My plans, boom, turn into a dog. And then you go down into this dungeon with exceptionally difficult puzzles that you have to solve as a dog. So wow. one of them, for example, is, and they're all really quick, very, very precise timing puzzles. So one of them is you step on a switch in one corner, and then it has these rolling boulders that go back and forth really quick between the two corners. And there's a switch on the other corner. And you have to time it so that you land on that ball 
and then get onto the other switch, but you have less than two seconds to do it. And if you miss... Yeah, this is a, this is a common theme throughout the game, these kind of puzzles. Though. If you miss, you have to start the puzzle over. Then the next one from switch two to three is the same, but from three to four, there are two boulders that hit each other in the middle. So not only do you have to jump onto one boulder, you have to transfer to the second one and then to the switch at the end. Wow, that's just bad. And that's one of the puzzles. There's four that are like that. And then oh, at, the, gosh. at the end, you get a Saturn stone. I don't know what any of those stones did. They're different rings. There's one I got towards the end, which makes your magic gauge go quicker, which is quite useful. Oh. So, um, I, we haven't mentioned this, but you get about half as do your sword gets upgraded to have magic powers. And if you let the bar go up, you can do it like a fire attack or an ice attack, depending on what sword you have. The witch at the end of this dungeon, this is probably the dumbest part of the game. She obviously had these contraptions in place to thwart somebody who is trying to stop her. So you, you come across her in this room at the very end, and she's up on a platform with two switches. She's like, you'll never get out of here alive. And she steps on a switch, and she goes, this big boulder comes down and crushes her. And she goes, ow, I made a mistake, <laughs> and then dies. <laughs> the other switch is the one that falls down and kills you. Okay. Wow. So dumb. Yeah. The uh the probably the the first dungeon for me that was difficult was the Verla Mines. Oh dear, this is terrible. I died so many times in there. That's the first dungeon that I actually had to leave. This is the first time the dungeon started to get really confused on layouts as well. I mean, for example, Zelda dungeons are pretty intuitively laid out where you understand, okay, I'm going to go here. They're going to give me an item which logically will lead me to the next area that I need to go to. This, not at all. It's just like, hey, no, let's you just can make go, a big you dungeon. You can go to the end of an area and find you don't have a key and then go back and wander around for about half an hour not realizing there's a door somewhere that you need to go through. And Well, this Ugh. one, like you had to, you came down the mines and then there's a room with... Uh, some green bubbles that you'd kill. And if you kill them, it changes which door is open. So the first third of the dungeon, you have to go through the door that it opens. And then halfway through that first third, you need to go back to that room, not kill them and go through a side door to get one key and then go all the way back to where you just were. Yep. And then, um, so frustrating. Were some of the worst puzzles for me were the ones where you had to get the enemies to press the switch. Oh man, how dumb were those? <laughs> extremely well they basically most of the time if you press the switch it stays on or you have to put a box on it to get it to work but some rooms there was no way to do this and you had to get the enemies to follow you and then quickly get to a door before the enemies done on the switch or jump on a platform or do something so yeah, what you'd have to do it so difficult the only way i could find to do it was that you'd run around slow enough that the enemies would line up behind you yeah and then you'd exactly lead so. them so that you would jump over the switch and then like the third enemy in line would be on the switch by the time you got to where you needed to be so difficult. there were but so some, many some of the enemies just jump over the switch there were so many <laughs> where it's like there's a locked door that you'd have to be by the gate and then clip through the gate as they hit the switch yeah but there was a way to get actually over the gates without opening them if there was a box in the room you could jump on the box and jump over the gate okay there's a nice there is a couple rooms i did that on Probably the most frustrating, not most frustrating, but one of the most frustrating was um, when you had to go down into the crypts in Mercator and you had to do those eight puzzle oh, rooms. Yeah. So there was Which a, aren't obvious at all. Well, there was, a, there was a, a plaque outside that you had to read that would give you a clue as to how to beat that room. But they the, still weren't very useful, though, were they? No. The Maria <laughs> Hysteria room where you had to kill... The monster with a boulder took me half an hour. Oh, God, that was terrible. Half an hour. I couldn't do it. Because, first of all, I I didn't know how to throw something. And it's not intuitive. No. You have to jump and then press the... Yeah, but sometimes button. you could throw it at him and it would hit him and do nothing. Yeah. But what happened to me is I, I figured out how to finally kill him. But it wasn't giving me that, that sound like, hey, you'd beaten this puzzle. Yeah, that happened to me as well. Apparently, if you swing your sword in that room, it does not work. That's it. When I would go to pick up the boulder, I'd be swinging my sword to pick it up. 
I had to Google this a million times before I found this answer. I had to watch a walkthrough on a video. Like, yeah. how do you beat this? And even that, I'm like, I'm another, doing that. There was another puzzle. I can't remember which dungeon it was in, where without warning, you suddenly had to build a staircase out of boxes. <laughs> out of pots. Yeah. You know, it's just like, this has never been said in the entire game. How do I meant to know this? <laughs> so <laughs> and tough. And then basically when you do this, you have to put a pot down, then jump on the pot, angle yourself so you're sort of not at the end of the pot, and then put the pot on top of the other pot, jump onto the next pot, and do the same thing again. And remind remind you, if you throw the pot, they shatter, and you have yeah, to start you have all to over. leave the room and come back in. But what makes it worse again. is that the controls don't line up with the way that you can walk on the pots. No. It's so oh, hard. Eric, what about the puzzle where you had to put the boxes in the holes? I was going to hopefully avoid that one. I spent way more time on that than I should have. Oh, me too. Basically, there's four holes in the ground. You have to, you have three boxes, and you have to put three of them in the holes to press switches which are in the holes, but the, the precision with which you have to put these boxes in the holes is ludicrous. It took me 20 minutes before I realized, okay, I'm going to pick up the box, I'm going to step into the hole, I'm going to yeah, jump even out. Even into the hole was an exercise in itself. Well, what I thought was happening is that it, I got it to work for one. I jumped in, jumped out. I was perfectly lined up, took a step, turned around, dropped it in, and it fit. After that, I physically could not get myself to step into a hole. Like, no. did this glitch out? So then I sat there trying to drop him in and went, screw this, and walked out. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this again. And I just happened to get it to work. Yeah, this is what, exactly what happened to me as well. But um, even that compared to the last one of the last puzzles in the game is ridiculous seriously yeah you don't even know how annoying this is without save states i would have been doing this for days it's um basically you're in a room and there's little alcoves between uh podiums okay. in the left hand corner there are two of those statues that move right so you have to go down to a switch you press the switch the first statue starts to move right you have to then move into the first alcove quickly so it goes on your head and it goes on the second podium. Each podium is one square and then you have to go round to the second alcove so it goes on your head again, round to the third, round to the fourth and then it finally presses a switch. When it presses the switch and then activates the other statues, you have to run to the top right of the room to do the same again. Oh my God. It is ridiculous. It's not even possible without safe states, I don't think. But even then you have literally a split second because of the controls again you're talking complete and utter precision i don't even know how i did it but i was so happy when i did Ugh. so you would have lost there what is... little hair you have left yeah yeah no <laughs> um there's so many frustrating points in this game um for example after you beat the mines you go back to town and when you're in the mines, you're you're rescuing people, and they're telling you like, "Hey, this tunnel's almost done. You know, we can, you know, don't tell anybody about this." So then you need to get to a, a new town called Destal, and the only way to get there is through the mines. So I figured, okay, after I beat one of the bosses in the mines, I found this room with these people digging a hole. Oh, that's the way to go. So I went all the way back into the mine, traipsed through all the rooms, all the enemies again to get to that room where I fought the boss. And then went back into the dungeon, and there was nothing there. Just a dead end. Yeah, I was the same. And then realized... I actually spent a good hour wandering around the world looking for the next place to go before I went there. And, well, and then I realized, like, oh, you drop into the mine, and there's a door immediately right there that you can go through to get to Destal. So frustrating. Yeah. Like, how are you supposed to know to go this there? This is the thing with this. There's no direction where you should be going at any point. And it's just... I mean... We've been excessively negative about this. I mean, I I did enjoy some bits of it. Oh, it, the I think it's a great line, game. But there's so much frustration. It's it's a lot. You have to have a lot of patience. It's a testament to how far we've come in game design and structure of dungeons. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the controls will put off a lot of people. I mean, you kind of sort of get used to them. So I wouldn't remember. There's, I recommend you play this on the original console because it will be impossible. There's one other spot that, just a story element that I thought was really odd. So after you're in the mountainous area, you see a cutscene of the Duke, Duke Mercator, um, 
talking to a girl that he's kidnapped, yes. telling her, um, sing a song from your childhood because he's captured all of these stones. And apparently, once you collect all of these stones, he basically steals them from Nigel. Nigel collects them in each of the dungeons, and then somehow the Duke shows up or his cronies show up, steal the stones, and then you come across the area where you utilize these stones, and he tells this girl to sing a song from her childhood that will activate the stones so he can continue on. And he says, sing this song or I'm going to bash your head in. And she's like, I'm not <laughs> afraid of death. And then he goes, fine, I'll put a frog in your dress. And that freaks her out more than dying. And yep. then the song that she sings is something like Inagata De Vida, baby. <laughs> Just... I like the um, I like the spells where they were backwards. Oh, they were God. good ones. Yeah, there, there's a there's a a mystic in the game, and they were apparently trying to come up with a uh, mystical sounding language, and they just wrote a sentence and flipped it backwards. <laughs> it's good good stuff. That like the dumbest thing. Um, did you did you look up what happens at the end? No, hold on. Before we get there, did you utilize the fast travel system at all? I didn't until the end. I realized, I thought that the daft trees that you see everywhere, I was like, that's clearly going to be like a fast travel system. Or something. I completely missed the one where you have to activate it. I so, I saw it as I was reading through one of the walkthroughs. They're saying, okay, on your way to Mercator, you're going to see a tree that's obviously in distress. I walked that path 50 times, never found the tree. And then I went back towards uh, Gumi and saw the tree. I'm like, well, this is clearly in the wrong spot. So I went through that very, very frustrating, difficult dungeon to do. But I didn't understand how the system worked because it it seemed like two trees were tied together. So these random trees around the world, usually outside of a town that you could walk into, and then some of them would have a doorway. And that doorway would teleport you to another tree. But I don't understand how you activate those two trees. Well, they're not activated already when you did the first dungeon. No, they didn't activate all the trees. Oh, after okay. I, think I, you must have to, I think you must have to visit both of them, and then they're just open. I don't know. It was just annoying. But, so, but obviously, you can't select where you want to go. They just go one place. I didn't really place. find a whole lot of need to go back to previous cities, with the exception of going back to Masan to find that dog. Yeah, there wasn't much need, really. I mean, there's some livestock that you can collect they're everywhere. So what One of happens? The most useful items you find, in my opinion, is the healing boots. Oh man, there were times where I just walk around a room till I was full again. Yeah, basically these, uh, your health goes up when you walk, so you just walk, <laughs> like Eric says, round and round in circles to get your health back up. When you have seventy odd life stocks, it takes quite a while. Yeah, they don't heal very quickly. It's probably like one heart every five seconds. Yeah. So, it's still useful because you die a lot more if you didn't have them. There are different items and equipment hidden around the world that you can easily miss, like the upgraded breastplates or the swords or anything like that. Yeah. It's not built into the game. Like, they don't make sure you get it. Not at all. So what happens at the end? Well, you go through well, the dungeon you're in. You have to fight three mini bosses which are exceptionally difficult. The first one is a lava guardian. There's four, there's four pot-like pools of lava where he pops up and throws fire at you. And basically, you have to run at him really quickly and hit him. And then he'll go somewhere else, probably hit you. But each hit does about 20 health. So even if you've got 70 things, you're dead after like four hits. It's like fighting uh, Zack, that eagle. Yeah, that he was, was difficult He too. was very difficult. And then, but this lava guardian, and I just stood in the top right and I found a spot where he would constantly just appear in the pool in front of me and then I could hit him and I did it for ages because I didn't have as many life stocks. It took absolutely ages. The second mini boss is, I think, you know, the doppelganger from earlier on. Your doppelganger. Yeah, he yep. shows up again and you have to kill him. And then there's another boss, which is like an armored armadillo thing, and he does this charge attack, which again takes off about 20 health. Do they ever explain who your doppelganger is and why he's in there? I think... No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh. But then, I, when you kill these mini-bosses, you get these three items called, like, Giro's Claw or Giro's Horn or something like that. Okay. 
and then you have to take these items and go to a final dungeon, which is King Knoll's like treasure place. Okay. Which is that's where I was doing that really frustrating puzzle before, and uh, you go through all of that and you get to the end, and then you find out the King Knoll is actually still in his treasure chamber, and he don't want you to take his treasure. So you have to fight King Knoll, and this, I kid you not, this boss fight took half an hour. He has so much health. It's ridiculous. How many Eki Ekis did you go in with? Nine? Uh, nine, but because I'm safe state, and I was kind of cheating the system, mm. making sure I wasn't getting hit much. Of course. But it still took it still took forever. And but then when King Knoll finally dies, out of nowhere a dragon comes. <laughs> a big okay. ass purple dragon who is on the top right of the ledge with its claws dug in, and then its head comes down and starts breathing fire at you. This dragon also has a stun attack where it knocks the ground and you have to jump before it knocks the ground, otherwise you get stunned, and then it breathes fire at you, it takes up about twenty five health. Wow. And uh, so basically, you just have to kind of jump around, hit it in the head a million times. And, then and you have finally... to do this immediately after King Knoll. Yep. Oof. With no break. And then the dragon dies, and then you get all the treasure. And then he goes, we've got all the treasure, and all this gold total goes up loads. And then he just goes, right, I want to go and look for more treasure now. <laughs> <laughs> after the weird fairy girl uh, says her undying love for Nigel. Wow. And my God, these boss fights were so, so difficult. Possibly the hardest boss fights I've ever done on a game. These last two. Yeah. Huh. Even though the mini bosses before that, were, you have to have a lot of patience with this game. Because them dungeons before the mini bosses are so long and difficult as well. You just, I don't even know how you could physically do it without save states. I just don't think it's possible. Do they give you an opportunity to restock on Eki Eki's before you go fight King Knoll? Nope. Wow. Well, you can do it before you go in that dungeon, but that, that dungeon's long. Huh. I mean, oh, there's one save point in that dungeon where you stop, by the way, where you have to navigate a series of puzzles just to get the book so you can save it. <laughs> Jeez. It's, it's so annoying. <laughs> It's almost anno- it's almost annoying to the point where it sounds unfair. Like they just made it difficult for the sake of making it I think difficult. The difficulty spike in the last half of the game is ludicrous. Wow. I I, I think that's the point where most people just go right. I'm not going to do this. So I'm exceptionally proud of myself for finishing this game because it was so hard. I think I got to the final point where it started to crest into frustration. That that last dungeon cave that I was in is just like, this is getting absurd. Yeah, don't bother, man. It's just so hard. I still like it. I don't want to try to detract people from trying this game because it's super entertaining. Yeah, You've got to think it's a, a product of its time again. I mean, they were doing things that a lot of people hadn't done yet. And sure, the platforming and the controls are terrible, but... I mean, you've got a half-decent story, some good mechanics in there, and if you can get past the frustrating bits, you'll find quite a lot of enjoyment of, through this game, I feel. Huh, yeah, I agree. It's it's worth trying. I think it's on the yeah. Wii U or the Wii Virtual Console for a few bucks, or you can just emulate it, but it's definitely fun. I think it's on Steam as well. It is. Because they've got that Mega Drive thing now. We were supposed to do a giveaway of it. We'll do that. I guess next week. I forgot to send that out. Uh, we'll put it on Facebook or something. We'll send yeah. it out. Yes. Any final thoughts on Landstock or? Uh, no. You? You good? No, I'm good. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think... Actually, I know for a fact Alundra improves upon this game. Alundra is one of my all-time favorite action-adventure games. Uh, I'm going to have to play that at some point. Well, we're going to play it for the show, so just hold your tits. Uh, I will hold my tits. Do not play Alundra 2. That is a hot pile of garbage. Is it as bad as Goof Troop? Well, it's a PlayStation 1 game. They tried to take it from its top-down Zelda-style game to like a 3D adventure game, and it just didn't work. Yeah. But Alundra, the first Alundra is an exact Zelda clone, but bigger. It's huge. I've never beaten it, and I've put like 
50 hours into it. It's really, really big. And the story mm. is incredibly good. Um, it basically... I should have to play it. A, a little overview of it is you are an elf who looks identical to Nigel. So I'm, you could even just be Nigel. Um, but uh, you are on a ship that gets shipwrecked and you show up on this island and everybody here is being tormented by nightmares by this uh, this demon who is rebelling that they outlawed the worship of idols. And he's tormenting people with nightmares. And these nightmares, if they aren't stopped, kill people. And you discover that you, the character Alundra, are the last surviving member of an ancient tribe of Elna who are called dreamwalkers and they can enter people's dreams and oh, that sounds awesome. They can enter people's dreams and fight off the nightmares. So you have real world dungeons and then you also have nightmare dungeons. It oh, is that sounds great. It is fantastic. It is one can of the best this, this week. We'll do it in a few weeks. I mean, oh. I, what I want to honestly, what I want to do is I want to bill it out far enough so that we can actually get through it. So maybe, I really like the sound of that, Eric. It is. It's so good. I mean, if I had to put it on par with my recommendations for you, it's up there with my recommendation of Rogue Galaxy. Oh, and I love Rogue Galaxy so much. I know there's a lot of games I'm like, you got to play this, but like Alundra truly is. If you like the Zelda style game, Alundra is. One of the best. I do like a RPG like that. And the story, I mean, the character development and the stories, you actually get really drawn in to the plights that are happening in this town because as people, like people die, people you get attached to in the story die and you see how it affects the other people in the village and then people start blaming you and then the whole dynamic of everything shifts. And Yeah, I you, love those kind of, old RPGs where the text based though, but you still get the emotion from it. Like Final Fantasy VI is incredible. And yes. Stuff. Like, I remember in Final Fantasy VI, the plot twist where halfway through the bloody world gets destroyed. It's so good. Yeah. It just comes from nowhere and then you, you're on an entirely different world map and stuff. It's just absolutely genius. Well, and I think a large part of that too is is the writing, but also the music. And the music in yeah. Alundra is incredible it's done by um uh working designs and they were really big in the rpg scene back in the playstation one era you know they did the lunar games and right. a bunch of that stuff so we will put that on the schedule for this year but i i either want to make it so that we do it incrementally like we talk about it over a few weeks because it is a very very large game Yep. Or we just give ourselves two months to play through it and just make sure we have it done. Well, me and you probably will. <laughs> well, maybe it's a game that you and I could then play through and do a show on. Yeah. Series of shows. Uh, Dan, let's do some emails. Emails. If you want to send us an email, factorysealed at manatank.com or podcast at factory-sealed.com. Either one will reach our stupid faces. The first one comes from Brian. He writes in, hey, Factory Seal crew, well, I am too lazy to go over all the episodes for a fourth time. I can name five games that Jess has completed off the top of my head. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, think I didn't we, even know there was five. I think we uh, requested somebody to do this last show. Oh, the oh, title of we? the email was Truant Jess. So here are the five games. Suikoden, check. Ocarina of Time, check. Undertale, okay, yeah, Beneath the Steel yeah, yeah. Sky. Did she finish that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think she did. Well, because it was only like three hours long. Even I didn't finish that one. <laughs> and Actual Sunlight. But that one was only an yeah. hour. So the short ones, apart from Ocarina of Time. I'm impressed that she finished Suikoden and Ocarina of Time. Like that right there is... It almost makes up for the fact that she doesn't finish anything else. We wouldn't have her any other way, though. It wouldn't yeah. be the same. We still love her. She, but Brian goes on. There are probably more, but I can't remember. Suikoden and Ocarina of Time are probably worth three games each. The th Brian, there isn't more. The Let's face it. The thing I fault her on is her constant absenteeism. I think she was <laughs> absent for like eight of the last 20 shows. <laughs> 
How fitting is yeah. that that this email that she's left again <laughs> shows up on an email on a show where she's gone. He, yes, we are throwing you under that bus. <laughs> he has a question. Oh no. His question is, which one of these do you think will be more popular use of virtual reality? Gaming or porn? Porn. Oh, hands down, porn. <laughs> hands down. There's no, there's no competition. Yeah. I uh, I think... People will say they're buying it for the games, but they're not really. I think... Gaming is going to be a little bit of, a, I don't want to say a flash in the pan for VR because I think it's here to stay, but I don't think it's going to become full mainstream. No. But I think the it porn does industry. Fun. It does look fun, mind. If it wasn't such a high cost, I would think I would get one. But oh, I can't afford oh, that. oh, the Best Buy, a mile from my house, has PlayStation VR demos today. I'm going to try it. Oh, sweet. I'm super excited for it. I mean, I've played a lot of games on the uh, HTC Vive. It's insane. It is absolutely incredible. Is that the one with the motion controllers? Yes. The Oculus uh, will see, have that's it. that's what I think the PS Move thing is going to be lacking. It's, for the well, the, the, the PS Move controllers. Move has it. Yeah, but they're not like grabbing things, are they? Well, you're not grabbing things with the Vive. It has triggers, just like the PlayStation Move does. They're exactly... They feel, for all intents and purposes, like you're holding Move controllers. I suppose. Um, there's, a, there's a game called Fant- Fantastic Contraption, which is hands down the coolest VR game I've ever seen. And it's just a simple... You have this pink ball that you need to get into this pink square somewhere out there but you you have to build these contraptions and you have three elements you have motors which are wheels and then you have wood which has weight and then you have foam which has no weight and you need to build these Mm -hmm. contraptions to carry this pink ball out there it's so much fun have you played a third person vr game yet i don't think they have third person vr they do they do I played a game I, um, called Hover Junkies that actually made me almost throw up. Hmm. Because you're on these platforms. It's a shooter game, multiplayer shooter, but you're on these motorized platform vehicles that only move in lateral directions. And since I you, saw you your sorry, your, your brain is like, "Hey, I'm moving," but your body doesn't have that sensation, so your equilibrium yeah. is off. I saw a controller the other day which is like kind of a like a circular pad on the floor, and you put your feet on it, you sit down. You put your feet on it, you can like lean the pad forward to move. Interesting, because the, the action RPG that we have, um, you have to point and click where you want to move, but you're still in yeah. first person, then it's like sword fighting, but you can't physically walk. I think the downfall of VR at this point is that you're still tethered to something. As soon as they can do it wirelessly... I think you'll be better because mm-hmm. we were constantly tripping over the cable and it just kind of pulls you out of it. That's the thing. I think I would crash into everything. We, I, I'm What I'm surprised after E3 is how much big game companies are getting on board with this. Which is why like, I don't think VR is going anywhere because not many no, big, like, big game companies got on board with 3D. Let's face it. They have Rocksteady making Batman VR. We have Final Fantasy 15 VR, which is just a separate experience. Which is supposed to be shit. Apparently. <laughs> but there's there's all kinds of stuff. The setup um, that we have at my friend's house for the VR is upstairs in a loft. And the staircase going down is right there. So whoever's watching has to stand there and make sure the person doesn't wander down the stairs. Okay. It's... It's interesting. I mean, I, I'm i going to buy the PlayStation VR just because it's new and it's going to be fun. But I don't know. Do you know. think it will be sustainable fun, though? Like, do you think do you or, think it will wear off? Oh, it, it already has. The, the HTC Vive has completely lost its appeal and allure because there's so much work in setting it up. So you, yeah. have, you have these light box sensors that you have to mount in the ceiling six to seven feet up 
in opposite corners. You have to angle them so that they see the whole room, but they can also see each other. And then every time you start up, you need to draw the square for your room. You need to calibrate the controllers, calibrate the headset. Gosh. It's a see, lot of work. problem with things like this. Like when Microsoft released Connect, it wasn't a viable thing for many living rooms. No, it's absolutely not. But like, there, there is, is a no chair. way where I live now that I could use that. There's a VR chair coming out that, that my friend Austin, who has the HTC Vive, is buying. It's like a $900 computer chair, but it's a full VR uh, capable chair. Motors and sensors and all of that shit. I think the coolest VR game that I can't wait to play is VR Racing. I haven't seen that one. Well, no, just if they made like a Gran Turismo, but you could still play it with a controller or a steering wheel, but you're in the cockpit like that. To me, that would be awesome. I don't want to get into like the whole first person shooters type stuff. There are certain games that I'll play on it. Yeah. Uh I wanna just just it just we've kind of skipped over all of E three, but I just wanted to ask you about um Death Stranding. What do you think? I don't know. I'm on the fence. I don't I don't really like when they take physical representations of a real actor and put them into a game. It worked okay for Beyond. But I think at that point they're relying too much on that character or that that actor's clout to sell the game. Yeah, I think because it's Hideo Kojima, though, it'll just sell itself. Could it be a dumber name though? Like, talk about a stupid name. I know name. it's just typical him. Everything about it, though, isn't it? Yeah, I loved it when he came out at the conference and he had that light flaw and he was just too fast. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's he's really bad live. Like they did the game awards a few years ago, and the whole time he just says, like, "Oh, sorry, sorry," just kept <laughs> apologizing. Watch, I watched the other day. I was watching uh, Konami, Konami again. Yes, yes, Konami. A uh, conference from like twenty twelve or something like that, or twenty ten, where it's just so bad. I don't remember Have you seen that it before. No, there's, there's like this guy. He's talking about I can't remember what game it is, and there's just this other guy standing behind him, just giving him a death stare for about five minutes. <laughs> I have not seen that. And they have luchador wrestlers on slapping each other in the chest. I need the to look that really, up. The guy really badly um, dancing to a dancing game and other assorted nonsense. It's like... Um, oh, I do like, recall it, that, yes. Yeah, and then there's the legendary weed music drummer guy who is hilarious. They brought in a professional drummer to play fake instruments. You could tell he hated himself for taking that. <laughs> so good. Then, of course, my personal favorite is Mr. Caffeine from Ubisoft. Mr. Caffeine. Or how about the doodly doodly doo guy? Time travel tried to do memes, and he was just so bad. The doodly... That's him, Mr. Caffeine. Okay, that is him. Yeah. Uh, Brian has a couple PSs on here. He says, does it horrify you when I say I use your podcast to help my girlfriend with her English? <laughs> your, your different accents help diversify... <laughs> <laughs> you okay please please stop using us as self-help bits his just this role model it should not happen his justification your different accents help diversify the spoken <laughs> english she can understand and she enjoys your banter before you start talking about the game of the week she has a hard time understanding dan but likes when he says what <laughs> I knew that was coming as soon as you said that. <laughs> uh, her favorite games to play when she was growing up in Laos is Pepsi Man and Super Mario Brothers 3. Uh, PPPS in Sydney, McDonald's has started selling their chips covered in gravy. If I add cheese curds to this, would this be considered the most disgusting poutine in the world? Yes, it would. I'm quite interested in chips and gravy, though. You've never had poutine? No, it's. I used to rag on it till I had it in Canada. It's actually really good. Yeah, but that's got cheese on. This is just chips and gravy, and the best thing ever. Ugh. Daniel, hello. Do you want to read the next email? I shall. This is from Mark Marcheski. Ahoy, Sealy crew! Excellent start. <laughs> While I didn't give 100th episode feedback, I'll add a fan shit-coloured style layered statement to say I think my favourite memories of the show are the times Aaron or someone would be playing a game scheduled for that week, the first time during the podcast. <laughs> but in the gap I listened to, 
<laughs> some old episodes, and I think the Aladdin versus Aladdin one, having that was and much more was my favourite. What really remains consistently hilarious is even then there was topic talk of how you didn't play enough Sega Genesis games, and you were saying you should play a Harvest Moon game. We still haven't done that, have we? No, we need to. Anywho, I noticed you uploaded a bunch of Factory Sealed Relives episodes. So I watched the June one Tom did and has given me a question. Is there port versions of games you played you still like despite knowing the version is a lot less deep or more flawed? I, for one, played tons of Civilization Revolution for the 360, enjoying it despite being a way too simplified version of Civ. That was the one that I was actually going to go with was Civilization Revolution. That game was fantastic because the full PC version of Civilization, who has 20 hours to devote to one game? Just one match of Civilization. So my uncle and I used to play Revolution multiplayer all the time. Mm. I, I can't really think of any port games I've played. Where it's a it's a series, but it's kind of a watered-down version of it. Um, yeah, I know. Hmm. Uh, the Sims 2 is terrible on PS2. Yeah, but did you enjoy playing that? No. <laughs> I can't really think. That's a tough question. Command and Conquer doesn't work very well on console. I disagree. Red Alert on the PS1 was actually pretty good. I did enjoy it. I just, looking back, it doesn't play as well. Oh, yeah. If you have a mouse and keyboard, it's ten times easier. I More recently, I tried Zombie on um, PS4, and that hasn't ported mm. particularly well from Wii U. Zombie. Zombie. Zumba. Oh, boy, oh boy. I don't know if there really are that many. Yeah, I know. Interesting question. If if you can think of any other ones, shoot us an email about that. I would like to hear more of those because I just mm. don't know. As for the uh, the feedback, we used to, well, not we, Aaron used to just play the game of the week as the show was starting or during the show. <laughs> so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> Like, Aaron, what'd you think of this game? Hold on, I'm still playing it. It's like, no, dude. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, next email comes from Sam Chun, entitled Sweet Zelda Clones. Um, as per the norm, he has written a long email, so I'm going to try to condense it, but it is very relevant to our show today. Greetings, Factory Sealed crew. I was very excited when you all decided to play Land Stock or for the Sega Genesis Mega Drive. I was excited enough that I decided to break out my Genesis, dig up my copy of Landstalker, complete in box, and shove it into the system and start playing. Definitely oh, not you disappointed. Poor bastard. Yeah. It's a very different feeling playing on a console rather than emulating it. Um, I did not get as far as I would like, but I did play long enough to get a feel for the game again. It's not surprisingly difficult to get somewhat used to odd perspective and movement controls, though I can understand why it could be considered difficult to deal with. Um, overall, I was happy to play Landstalker again, and I'll probably devote the time to finish it over the summer. Good luck. Mm, good luck. <laughs> Unfortunately, good luck. a couple of the other Zelda clones on the Genesis Mega Drive are more memorable for me in my recommendations for this week and are found in the postscript of this email. Uh, before I get to that, while I was playing Landstalker, I was wondering what makes Zelda games and Zelda-like games fun to play. So my question for you all this week is, what part of Zelda game or Zelda light game is your favorite part and keeps bringing you back to playing them? I love the sense of progression where you get new items. As long as it's logical it, and it uh, that item functions within that dungeon. Yeah, like in Zelda, you get an item where you, which suddenly opens up more of the world. And I love that. I love the kind of Metroidvania aspect with a game where you get that and you explore more areas based on what items you get i just like it. it it adds a sense of progression and you feel like you're improving over time that's why i like it i think for me what it is is the different items but using them within that dungeon and seeing how the dungeons and how you progress through but then they stack on top of each other so by the time you're at the final dungeon you have this whole inventory of weapons or items that you need to use to get through, and it makes each puzzle just a little bit more difficult. Because, like, well, how do I approach yeah. this one? It's the evolution of the mechanics through time, isn't and, it? And just as you get used to that one, they introduce something new. So just before it starts to get stale, they're like, okay, here's a new one. But bizarrely, the new Zelda is open world, so... And you don't even have to finish the story to beat the game. 
I'm so excited for that, by the way. I am too. Uh, awesome. Sam says for him, I want good level design. Level design is nice and varied and a little challenging at times. I'd be very happy with it. Once again, I love what you guys do and hope you find some more retro games that will be fun to play. Regards, Sam. Here are his recommendations. Uh, Beyond Oasis, the story of Thor, depending on your location, or Crusader of Senti or Soleil, depending on location. Uh, the second one is a heavy Zelda-like game focusing on platforming and puzzle solving. Huh. Put, okay. Put those on the old list of roo there. Yes. That's it for emails. You know, send us an email, factorysealed at manatank.com or podcast at factorysealed.com. Dan. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you all? Great. I think that's going to do it for this week. Where can we find you on the Twitter? On the Twitter, you can find me at Jock Buns. Did you switch it? No. Oh. <laughs> Still frosted sloths. You really Please need... follow me. I need friends. You really need to find me one of those shirts and send it to me. I'll pay you for it. <laughs> I wear a men's large. Oh, you fat bastard. I know. Huge. I'm healthy. Where can we find you on the Twitter? You can find me at Honest Pizza. If you want to follow the show at factory underscore sealed or facebook.com slash factory sealed or factory dash sealed dot com, which will then have a YouTube link. Or Factory Sealed on Patreon if you want to donate to the show. Yes. Which we appreciate. You will and get giveaways. Or you uh. can also go to YouTube and search for Factory Sealed Plays or Factory Sealed Relives and you will find all of our lovely videos so you can listen to us be even more stupid with gameplay footage. Next week, we are playing, I think this is your recommendation, Flashback, is. Is the quest for identity. Incredible game. What the hell is it? What are we looking it's... forward to? It's like it's kind of like another world. We played another world before. Yes, the old PC game. Yeah, yep. It's very similar to that with the weird drawn backgrounds and stuff. So it's I s- quite difficult to play, but I think if you stick with it, you might like it. I saw the physical cartridge for this at the game store the other day, and I should have bought it. It was only like six bucks. Wow! Is it Surprise. worth having the cartridge, or is this going to be one that's going to be super frustrating and want to save state? It's probably a safe state one. Ugh. How long is it? Quite long. So we're probably not going to finish it. I don't think it's Landstalker length. Let's see. How long is Flashback? It is seven and a half hours. So remember... Might we, need to walk through for this one. We each will be recording our first half hour with this game. Yes. And then compiling it into a video. We're all doing the Super Nintendo version. But apparently it's out on... Genesis. There's a Super Nintendo version. Yeah, that's the one we're playing, isn't it? I didn't know there was a Super Nintendo it version. It came out on Amiga, PC, Mega Drive, Genesis, and Super Nintendo. I had no idea about that. So which we need to settle on it so we're all playing the same version. I was going to play the Genesis version. Okay, let's play the Genesis version because we haven't played many Genesis games. Isn't there a Sega CD version, though? Uh, I don't think so. I don't right, see just it. Just stick, stick with Genesis. We're good. Okay, because on our schedule... Oh, yeah, never mind. It says I added the SNES just in case. So that's what we're playing. Flashback Quest for Identity on the Sega Genesis. After that, this is a bit ambitious, Jess. She is recommending Zelda The Wind Waker. Oh, God. Yeah. That's going to be hard to get our hands on. Well, if you have a Wii U. I used to own it, though, and I've sold it. I'm not buying it again. Yeah, maybe we'll adjust that one. <laughs> so, all right, Dan, any final thoughts? Um, how much of an idiot are you this week? Mm, three. It's quite low on the idiot skill. I'm three idiot. Uh, Do you have about... any final thoughts? Mm, I need to save my thoughts for work this week. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. All right. We, we will don't actually think during this podcast. So uh, no, this is where I just dump out all the extra garbage that's accumulated in my head. Yep. All right. We're gonna see you all next week. Daddy, bye.